In this final video, we're going to talk about public key cryptography and what problems that was aimed at, what it solves. So in 1874, William Stanley Jevons wrote in The Principles of Science, can the reader say what two numbers multiplied together will produce the number 8616460799? I think it unlikely that anyone but myself will ever know. What he was trying to point out was that it is relatively easy, well, in fact, it's very easy to multiply two numbers together, um, but it's actually very difficult to do the reverse. So in this case, the factors of that number were 8908, 9681 and 96079. In 1977, MIT researchers Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Edelman came up with RSA, which took this whole idea of the difficulty of factorizing large numbers and created a public key cryptography algorithm. This algorithm, a public and private key is generated. The public key is shared, but the private key is secret. Encryption is brought is done by encrypting a message using somebody's public key, and decryption is done by decrypting a message with the private key. So if we take this situation where Alice wants to send a encrypted message to Bob, Alice will use Bob's public key to encrypt the message, to create the ciphertext, send that to Bob, and Bob then use, is his private key to decrypt it. So public keys are called that because they're public. Anybody can actually access anybody else's public key and it all works on that basis. A private key is exactly that, private, and it's not shared with anybody. So it's only the owner that possesses the private key. To prove that Alice was the one that sent the message, Alice encrypts the document with her private key and Bob decrypts it with Alice's public key. Again, only Alice could have done this because she's the one who has her private key. So this actually also authenticates Alice. In practice, we don't need to encrypt the entire document, but we can actually just encrypt a hash of the document. And that's only uh, a small, a much smaller amount. So just running through that again, Alice takes the plain text and encrypts it using her private key or encrypts a hash of that. And we'll look at what hashes are shortly, but sends that ciphertext to Bob. Bob wants to know that it was Alice that actually did this. So he takes Alice's public key, decrypts it, and then he has confirmation that it was Alice. Now, of course, he has to know that Alice's public key is actually Alice's, and there is um, a big problem with all of this, and we'll look at how public key infrastructure tries to solve that problem. So to achieve confidentiality and authentication, we can combine these two processes. Alice encrypts the document with her private key, and then she encrypts again with Bob's public key. Bob decrypts the document with his own private key, and then decrypts the document with Alice's public key. So it's protected to send to Bob, and we're also proving that it was Alice that sent it. So as I said, one of the big key problems here is public key distribution. So sending out your public keys is obviously much easier than sharing private keys. So symmetric key cryptography is a very big problem, especially as you scale up with lots of participants in how to distribute those keys. In terms of public keys, however, uh, there's still an issue about verifying that a public key belongs to the person it says. So there's two, two different types of approaches to this. There are decentralized models like PGP and OpenPGP that uh, we'll have a look at. And there are centralized models. So a central authority creates a card and manages the public keys for everybody. So in this case, for example, in Estonia, they have an ID card, which is a smart card. And on it would be your public and private keys. They maintain a register of everybody's public keys. PGP is pretty good privacy and was invented by Phil Zimmerman in 1991. 
This uses a variety of symmetric and public key ciphers, but it uses a web of trust to actually authenticate public keys. Estonian model needs proof of ID, so passports, driving licenses, and can only be collected in person. In fact, Estonia operates a digital citizenship process where anybody can apply for it to be a digital citizen of Estonia. But if you want to pick up the key, it has to be picked up from a consulate, uh, which is in Canberra, um, or some of the satellite stage sub subconsulates um, if they are available in, uh, in your Australian city or worldwide city. So the web of trust relies on validation through a network of people you trust. Ideally, however, this is verified in person, so you would exchange public keys with somebody when you meet them. You can have indirect trust if someone you trust directly trusts another person, um, but in practice this really just doesn't work. It can be manipulated very easily and it's too hard to do the due diligence. So a version can be used that uses trusted third parties, but that really isn't peer to peer. And this is one of the big problems about this whole idea of actually establishing identity. And peer to peer networks really operate on the basis of anonymity and not having to trust people that you're engaging with, not the other way around. So public key infrastructure is infrastructure that allows people to manage third party or internal systems that certify a public key. And we use certificates to do that. So there are certificate authorities that we trust to issue certificates. And these certificates actually are in themselves private and public keys um, that can be used to sign uh, other keys. So the CA, the Certificate Authority, delegates authority to identify uh, various people to registration authorities. Certificates are held in a database and can be checked for validity. And there is a certificate policy which can specify the architecture, what certificates can be used for, security controls, etc. Certificates are also used in the web um, to do uh, secure transport and you'll see you notice that every time you go and visit a secure site and you get a pass a padlock appearing on your browser and you can click on that and you can have a look at the certificate that was used to uh, encrypt that communication and prove that the person the server that was that was providing that communication is who they say they were So we've mentioned cryptographic hash functions a number of times. So what exactly are they? Well, it's an algorithm that maps data of arbitrary size to a bit string of a fixed size. So you can take a file of any length and you can hash it and it will always produce a series of bits or of bytes that are of fixed size. They are one way, they can't be inverted. So once you've hashed something, it is impossible to recreate the content from that hash and ideally you don't want there to be more than one bit of content producing the same hash. It can happen but very very rarely. So the properties of hashes are they are deterministic, the same message results in the same hash. They are very fast to compute. Uh, as I said it's very difficult to generate a message from its hash Small changes in the message result in large changes to the hash. That's quite important. So if you change a single character in a document, for example, the hash will be completely different. Two different messages are very unlikely to generate the same hash, but hash collisions, as they are called, do happen sometimes. So MD5 was one of the first cryptographic hash functions, and that was invented by Ron Rivest. MD5 was one of the first cryptographic hash functions, and that was invented by Ron Rivest, one of the RSA uh, researchers in 1992. And it's very common, but actually proved quite flawed. And we'll see why that's important, because hashes are used for passwords. SHA-2 is, or SHA-2, is the recommended now, although it does come from the NSA, um, the US National Security Agency. And that can output various sizes of hash, so 224 bits up to 512 bits. SHA-3 was released by NIST in 2015. So hash functions can be used to store passwords. And this is quite important that 
we never store passwords or should never store passwords in clear text, um, that only the hashes should be used. And in fact, when we take a password and hash it, we actually don't just store the password. We use a sort or an IV um, of random bytes and that is hashed and the hash is stored for verification. In fact, there's a process of hashing. It's not quite as simple as just taking a password and a sort um, and then hashing. Actually, it, it goes through a, ran, a series of uh, hashes uh, over and over again, um, a thousand or so times, and then stores that hash. Linux stores passwords in a file called the shadow file, uh, not in the password file that uh, we use in one of the labs. So to generate a password file, a uh, password hash, we can use a, a function called OpenSSL. And we say it's type six, um, give it a salt, which is random text, and then my secret password, and it generates that hash. We know that it's a Linux password because um, of the signature of the dollar six dollar, and that describes that, or well, that identifies it as a, a Linux type of password. So as I said, Linux will do the hash 5,000 times in an attempt to stop uh, brute forcing passwords. Uh, it doesn't work particularly well because obviously if you've got tables and people choose ridiculous passwords, it's relatively easy then to go through a pass using a password file of common passwords and then checking the hashes against each other. We can also use hashes for message authentication codes. And this is where a message is combined with a key and then hashed. This confirms that the message has not been changed. So this is uh, dealing with integrity. And so essentially Macs, as they're called, not to be confused with Mac addresses, which are the ethernet addresses on a network interface, but message authentication codes can be used with messaging to provide data integrity and authenticity. We can also use hashing for digital signatures, and this was proposed by Diffie and Hellman in 1976. So the digital signature algorithm, DSA, is part of NIST's digital signature standard. Um, and basically here we hash the message and this is then processed using the private key to produce a signature. The signature is attached to the document and sent, and we can check the signature uh, by taking the hash of the message and using the public key to verify it. So this is actually a very secure way of uh, using, say for example, government documents where you want to sign something electronically. You use your, your private key to do that and send it in and somebody can verify that it was actually used. And so, again, in countries like Estonia, all documents are verified using digital signatures using the smart card that they provide. Public key cryptography is actually pretty slow, and so it's not used for real-time encryption of, encrypt of communications. And that was a big problem, actually, uh, because we want to use it for that whole idea of identical um, identification of people and also authentication. Um, but we still need to encrypt the messaging and we need to exchange keys. So Merkel, Diffie and Hellman published a paper, pa well, various papers in 1976 and 7 on a method of exchanging public keys securely. It's known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's quite important. Um, but of course, there was Merkel, who was a student at the time, and uh, it should really have been called the Diffie Hellman Merkel key exchange. Once the keys are exchanged, a secret key can be generated and shared to do the symmetric encryption. So it's a multi stage process, and that allows us to do secure transportation, which actually drives the uh, mechanisms and protocols for secure HTTP or HTTPS or actually its official name, Transport Layer um, Security, which is TLS. So how does this work? Well, <laughs> again, this is some bits of math. Uh, you don't have to um, worry about it too much. It's relatively simple. I'll just run through it quickly, but uh, uh, you can go through it in more detail. I'll let you actually go through the verification for it uh, yourself. 
So Alice chooses two prime numbers. Okay, so just in case you don't remember, a prime number is any number that can only be divided by itself and the number one. So two prime numbers, G and P, and tells Bob what they are. Bob picks a secret number A and then computes um, a fairly simple number uh, A using that formula and then sends that back to Alice. Alice then picks her own secret number B and then computes another number and sends B back. Bob takes B and does some the same operation with it, um, B A mod P. Alice takes A and does an operation and then the numbers that, that result from that um, are the same. So this key that is generated can be used to then encrypt further communication. So this is magic really. Uh, essentially through this protocol there is a way of Bob and Alice deciding on a number that only they will actually know. Anybody eavesdropping on this will not be able to actually work out what that number was from the numbers that have been exchanged. And that's because some information is always retained by the individual parties. So you can work out, um, you can go through this with a practical example, substituting some numbers for it all to see how it works. And this gives you a good example of why Eve, who is eavesdropping uh, on the conversation, can't actually work out what the secret key is. Uh, from the information that she is able to actually overhear. However, Diffie-Hellman is vulnerable um, and is vulnerable to an attack called a man in the middle attack. Um, this is where an attacker inserts themselves in the communication and acts as a proxy so that Alice thinks that um, she's communicating with Bob but in fact is communicating with Eve Eve then passes on some information to Bob and vice versa. And so she's always intercepting all of the communication and basically then can determine and create keys for both parties and then intercept the secure communication. This is why you can actually use proof of identity uh, between Eve and Bo um, Alice and Bob to be able to sort of detect when the man in the middle attack has, been, has taken place but it's still a very common attack even today. So that wraps up uh, what we have covered in these set of videos on cryptography. What you should have really taken away from this is some of the fundamentals of cryptography that consist of using a key and a cipher to apply confusion and diffusion to plain text to generate ciphertext. We looked at some examples of modern cryptography and how this is developed to create fast and efficient ciphers and looked at key management to look at how we can handle both the cases of symmetric and asymmetric cryptography.